Greetings, my fellow freedom lovers and sovereign thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig Train, from the beautiful Swampy Mangroves, South Florida. And today's date is Friday, December 14th, 2018. So let us begin. Thanks for tuning in, my friends, and just for hanging out. And just uh, shooting the breeze. Some of my friends are in um, New York City. Hopefully, you folks be safe. Be careful with toxic air. Since September 11th, still out in the open. Yes, and I am at Collective Cafe. That's the name of the facility. And, uh, oh, I want to take a sweet time, I see. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's right in the heart of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to be exact. Pretty cool place. 954-248-3622. We're off of Broward Boulevard. North. West section on the corner of Northeast 7th Avenue and Broward Boulevard. Victoria Park. Interesting. Okay. Nice location. I'll leave, I'll leave the page up there so you folks want to check it out. That'd be awesome. And I do want to celebrate tomorrow 227 years. On this date, in, oh, it's December, 20, December 15th, 1791, the Bill of Rights has been honored in all 13 states. Virginia was the last state to do this. So I'm going to be addressing that. And, and, and others that pertaining to surveillances and so forth, which does not supersede our U.S. Bill of Rights culture. So, without further ado, instead of digressing myself to death, we're going to start right here from the National Constitution Center.org. Happy birthday, Bill of Rights, for the NCC staff. Today we celebrate the anniversary of the first ten amendments known as the Bill of Rights. It was ratified December 15, 1791. Here's what you need to know. What it does. The Ten Amendments that make up the Bill of Rights guarantee essential rights and civil liberties. I say natural born liberties. First Amendment guarantees the freedom of religion, speech, the press, assembly, and petition. The Second Amendment guarantees the right to bear arms. And, oh, I might offend some people like Ted Deutsch and all these other, and Chuck Schumer and all these other compromises out there. Oh my goodness, we can't say that to people. Well, I can. And the federal level is the non-debatable. Anyone who refutes it, null and void. Now, I will continue. Third Amendment prohibits the force of quartering soldiers. Fourth Amendment protects the people. From unreasonable search and seizures. The Fifth Amendment prohibits the people are being subjected to double jeopardy or being forced to testify against themselves. Ensure that life, liberty, or property may only be taken through due process and private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The Sixth Amendment protects the right to a fair trial by jury. The Seventh Amendment protects the right to a jury trial in civil cases. The Eighth Amendment prohibits excessive bail cruel and unusual punishment. The Ninth Amendment emphasizes certain rights being listed in the Constitution does not mean those are the only rights that belong to the people. Exactly. It's considered natural, a revised version about certain natural born rights are inalienable. The Tenth Amendment states that any power not granted to the federal government are reserved to the states and the people. Interesting there because a lot of folks, yeah, in that area, even there's certain laws they try to use on the state level, and they say, and they try to use the First Amendment, and all that. It's always good to know your state constitution as well. And many of you heard on my show that have been listening for a bit long period of time understand that completely, and you got to pursue it because a lot of those amendments do coexist with the U.S. Bill of Rights. There's things called the Declaration of Rights in a lot of states, of course, the Bill of Rights, which it all means government keep out. Absolutely. And this is here, why, why it was added, one key debate surrounding the creation of the U.S. Constitution was the inclusion of a Bill of Rights. Several delegates at the Constitutional Convention were concerned that without a Bill of Rights, our most important rights would be unprotected. Others felt that a Bill of Rights was unnecessary, that outlining certain rights would imply 
that those were the only rights reserved to the people. By the end of the convention, a Bill of Rights was overruled. The Constitution Sands Bill of Rights was signed by 39 delegates on September 17, 1787. At Independence Hall in Philadelphia, three other delegates were present but refused to sign in, part because of the absence of a Bill of Rights. Ed Elber Elbridge Gary of Massachusetts and Edmund Randolph and George Mason of Virginia. Out of the convention, the absence of a Bill of Rights emerged as a central part of the ratification debates. And any of those who oppose ratification point to the missing Bill of Rights as a fatal flaw. Several states ratified the Constitution on the condition that Bill of Rights may be promptly added and may even offer suggestions for what to include. And they have everything here word for word in this con um, language of the first ten amendments of the Bill of Rights. And it's really good to know these things because that is our obligation. And that's the federal government's duty to honor these rights. When you hear these stupid referendums that try to deprive it, they deserve a penile microphone. It's not sexual harassment either. That's why I always say with the late Jeffrey Hughes, government keep out. That's what the Bill of Rights is. When you get up in the morning on this great day, tell everyone, happy birthday, Bill of Rights. Say yes to freedom and no to tyranny. And teach others this information. We all have to be the rabbis, the teachers, because the state schools are not going to teach you that. We have an obligation to share this with others. And it's all right. I like doing this. And I'm proud of sharing this information to everyone that listens to this show. So please, I urge everyone out there to focus on this because they want to use all these stupid laws like the Patriot Act, the Campaign Reform Act, all these weak, pathetic, and alien seditions act, which John Adams signed into law as one of his biggest mistakes. Of course, Abe Lincoln liked to deprive on our U.S. Bill of Rights culture as well. I'll tell you, he he fought, he ended slavery. No, he didn't. He never really cared. Only if you, only time you could, if you really, really know about Abe Lincoln, read his, examine his first inaugural address as president. It's very self-explanatory. That's one of the areas you have to look at. And it's cool about the National Constitution Center. They have a podcast, Cohen Trump Campaign Finance Law. So a lot of, like, um, they teach you things was constitutional, which is not. Remember, President Donald Trump is not going to save our Constitution. So please don't follow that herd conform mindset. We all have obligations. Start from the bottom up, not the top down. This is why our U.S. Bill of Rights culture is has to be sacred. And it's auto-nullification. Any laws they try to put in the books is null and void. And you can tell it to all those crybabies, political bobbleheads, that, that believe they're lawyers and they know more than you. Laugh at them. Ridicule them. Because they, they, they assume you want to kiss, they deserve to kiss, they deserve to have you kiss the floor they walk on. And I say, no way, no how. You work for me, chumps. Deep down inside, you know I'm right. So please, all, all I gotta say, Celebrate the Bur Bill of Rights Day with homage. And don't worry, a little rebellion now and then is good. That's what Thomas Jefferson said, once said. So, I um, will continue on here. Speaking of this, this came from The Forward. Came out yesterday. It's interesting because, you know, they have the Israeli lobby and all these uh, the con people in Congress claim to be Jewish by faith. You got people at the state level. I said, we have to have the anti-Israeli boycott law because it's anti-Semitic. So, this is part of free speech, which is on our state's constitutions as well. All you gotta do is look it up, folks. It's very self-explanatory. So, this is what he has to say. Reveal secret ADL memo. That's an information leak. Slammed anti-BDS laws as harmful to Jews by Josh Nathan Kazis. Any defamation league has emerged as a supporter of controversial legislation targeting 
boycotts of Israel, but internal ADL documents obtained by the forward show that the organization's own staff believed the laws could actually harm American Jews. In the summer of 2016, ADL staff wrote an internal memo arguing that legislation against the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement was a really bad idea. Simply put, ADL does not believe that the anti-BDS legislation is a strategic way to combat the BDS movement or defend Israel and is ultimately harmful to the Jewish community. The memos read, it's called anti-BDS laws, ineffective, unworkable, unconstitutional, and bad for the Jewish community. Because they could be targeted. Collective targeting, which I boldly oppose, my friends. So I, I could tell you that for a fact. You know what I'm saying? Because it is very unacceptable in my eyes. Because you can't attack a particular group community because you got folks that want to support these particular bills. Well, we'll continue on here. Yet in the two years since the memo was written, the ADL has vigorously supported anti-BDS legislation, including one bill currently moving through the U.S. Congress, and some of those have passed in state houses across the country. Unconstitutional free speech in the state of Florida's Article 1, Section 4. If you don't like it, get the hell out of the Sunshine State because you're contaminating space. I will proceed. Of course, Good Flopper Scott signed it as a fact. Now he's a senator. Go figure, right? Civil liberties groups, including the American Civil Liberties Union, have called proposed legislation the anti the Israel Anti Boycott Act unconstitutional. The ADL on his website asked supporters as the lobby that represented to support its passage. The memo from the summer of twenty sixteen reveals a stark division with the ADL between the analysis Ooh, analysis provided by the organization's professional staff and the path taken by its board and CEO. It also illustrates the delicate balance the organization has struggled to strike since the departure of former director, national director, Abraham Foxman, between critics on the right who accuse it of liberal bias and critics on the left who condemn it what they see as an insufficient commitment to civil rights. Natural born rights, to be exact. My impression is that it's designed to bolster their credentials among the Jewish right, said Joshua Shane, a professor of Jewish studies at the College of Charleston of the ADL support for some anti-BDS legislation. I'm assuming that it's a combination of concerning about losing donors in the right and some level of sympathy. The ADL did not respond to multiple requests for comment on two internal ADL documents obtained by the forward, the text of which the forward provided to the ADL. It also did not respond to questions about its current positions of on anti-BDS laws. After this article was published, the ADL provided the following statement. Quote, as with most organizations, ADL routinely has robust internal discussions about various policies positions. On the issue of opposing BDS, our stance has been perfectly clear and it is top of the priority of ours. The anti-BDS bill through Congress appears to be close, close to, to passing. Technically, an update of, 1970, of the 1970s era legislation that bans U.S. companies from participating in the boycott imposed by another country. The new act would ban participation in boycotts by foster, fostered by international organizations. It's particularly intended to target efforts from the U.N. Human Rights Council and other groups of boycott companies doing business in the West Bank. Yeah, I want to have someone tell me how to wipe my rear end too, right? Shoot. Its supporters are trying to get through before the end of the year as part of the spending bill, according to The Intercept. For the first introduced in 2017, the bill has been a major legislative priority for the, American, for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee and other Jewish groups, including the ADL, have added their support. It has faced opposition from civil libertarians. Local anti-BDS laws, meanwhile, have passed in 26 states. These measures generally seek to keep state governments from doing business with companies that participate in the boycott of Israel. Federal courts have overturned a handful of the laws amidst challenges brought by civil liberties groups say they restrict First Amendment rights. Of course, in Florida, Article 1, Section 4 of the Florida Constitution. But I forgot, the idiots in Tallahassee and flip flopper Scott know better. The two, the, the two internal ADL documents obtained by the forum was, were drafted by staff members in the summer of 2016 at a time when the ADL regional offices were fielding requests from other Jewish groups to work together on passing state-level anti-BDS laws. ADL was also under criticism from right-wing Jewish groups 
particularly the Zionist Organization of America, opposing some of its uh, some of the anti BDS bills. Yeah, we know better than you how to think. The documents attack the the anti BDS laws as unconstitutional, bad policy, and generally bad for the Jews. The first document, a title, ADL's opposition on anti BDS legislation, says that the anti BDS are bad for American Jews, diverting community resources to be an ineffective, unworkable, and unconstitutional endeavor. And instead of investing in more effective multi-layer strategies, it says the bill raised a profile of the BDS movement while giving the appearance that the Jewish community exercises undue influence in government. <laughs> Interesting there, right? The memo argues that a model of many state-level laws have followed of identifying companies that boycott Israel and then banning financial ties between them and state governments was unworkable, since it would be difficult to prove why a particular company wasn't doing business with Israel. It's something, it's, it says that government investigation investigation into the reason why a particular company isn't doing business with Israel would represent a significant government intrusion. It goes on to argue that a decision to boycott a country as despicable as it may be in the case of Israel is constitutionally protected as a form of political speech. Anti-BDS often, bills often are portrayed as Mark, Marty, McCarthyist, McCarthyistic attacks on free speech and democratic values, the document reads. In turn, they give more attention to BDS supporters and turn them into First Amendment martyrs. A person familiar with the matter who asked not to be named to protect relationships as the people from a number of ADL departments collaborate together on a document which are in were intended to provide internal guidance to ADL staff. The person said that the ADL's national director, Jonathan Greenblatt, was unhappy with the document's con conclusion and the person does not believe the documents were ever circulated. At the, at the time they were drafted, the ADL's public posture of it on its on any anti BDS bills was changing dramatically. In twenty fifteen, when the push for anti BDS bills first picked up up steam, the ADL was a staunch opponent of the efforts. Foxman, the organization's former national director in an op in, a, in an op ed published in his last month at the helm, publicly condemned anti BDS laws. The appeal of such legislation is understandable. Foxman wrote any uh, wrote of the anti BDS bills, magic wands, however, are just that magical. They give one they give one the feeling of control and power, but they are not real. Greenblatt substantially changed the organization's approach on the issue in the summer of twenty sixteen, just as these internal memos were drafted, the ADL's public position on the legislation had turned confusing and self contradictory. On one hand, Greenblatt told the forward that summer that he believed that some anti-BDS legislations enacted recently on a state level was vulnerable to First Amendment challenges. At the same time, in June, he praised New York Governor Andrew Cuomo for his anti-BDS executive order, which was condemned by civil liberties groups. <gasps> Bing! The magic wand! Bing! Governor, Governor can sign anything he wants. Nolan Boyd, chump. Read your state constitution, dummy. We simply made it clear that ADL will not stand in the way of anti-BDS legislative efforts and will praise lawmakers who stand up to defend Israel, Greenblatt told the forward at the time. Yet the documents indicate in, that, that inside organization key staff members were not on board. The second 2016 document obtained by the forward was written as an infernal, internal FAQ on the ADL's position on the BDS said that politicians should be told that, an, that anti-BDS legislation is harmful to the Jewish community. ADL believes that you can applaud legislators, legislators or other elected officials for standing with Israel and condemning BDS efforts. It reads, however, anti-BDS legislation is ultimately harmful to the Jewish community. Efforts should be made to educate legislators and others about why anti-BDS legislation is harmful to the Jewish community and undermines efforts to meaningfully combat BDS. Since this essential to, to Foxman's post, Greenblatt has battled battle allegations from right-wing groups and conservative Jewish critics that he was steering into ADL in a partisan liberal direction. Greenblatt has been unsparingly critical of the Trump administration and made criticism of Trump policies as a hallmark of his leadership. Yet, 
on anti-BDS laws, he has fallen in line with some of the conservative critics. In September 2017, Greenblatt co-authored a Washington Post op-ed supporting the Anti-Israel Boy Israel Anti-Boycott Act, arguing that it would not restrict free speech. In his op-ed, Greenblatt wrote that concerns about the bill were unfounded. Israel did not respond for a request for comment on his current position on the act. On his website, he encourages supporters to send their senators an email that end. You support for the Israel Anti-Boycott Act will send a clear message that internationally motivated boycotts against Israel are unacceptable to the United States. Yet, civil liberties groups led by the ACLU have raised consistent concerns about the bill, even after it was rewritten earlier this year to remove the possibility of jail time for those who broke the law. Hey, I say no victim, no crime. When boycotts are particularly motivated, they are protected as free expression under the Constitution. And that's why the ACLU opposed the bill. Kate Roane, um, senior legislative counsel at the ACLU, told the forward, the government is just not permitted in the U.S. to disfavor one side in the political debate. The st story has been updated with a statement by, provided by the ADL after the story was, um, pub was published. Interesting there. So, yes, a lot of stuff has been going on. And the truth of the matter is, my friends, it's free speech. You have the right to criticize anyone, including the government of Israel. If you don't like it, too bad. That's how it goes. Even the Ku Klux Klan all, and the neo-Nazi groups and, and all these radical, racial, separatist groups, doesn't matter where they come from, they can go criticize everybody else what they want. But if you make threats, it's a whole different ball game. This is why I'm very pro free speech. It's more important than your feelings. And this is something like this. Anti-BDS acts are null and void. Too bad. I don't care. And it doesn't make me anti-Semitic. Okay? Plain and simple. So next one here. came from uh, Activist Post yesterday by Aaron Kazel. Facebook fails sought patents to predict where you are going. Fa going. Fact checkers are losing trust. Alternative media tar targeted. I wonder why. Three cr creepy patent applications described using your historical location data and others to determine where users will go next or when they will be offline to feed FB kid content. BuzzFeed reports that Facebook has filed several patents with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for technology that intends to predict your location. The first application was filed on May 30, 2017, titled Offline Trajectories. Describe a process to predict where Facebook users will go next on location data. The technology outlined in the patent, on a patent will calculate a transition prob probability based on at least a part on a previous log data, location data, associated with the plurality of users who were at the current location. The second, second more worrying privacy invasive Facebook patent application titled Location Prediction using the wireless signal on online social networks illustrates how tracking the strength of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, and near-field communications signals can be used to estimate current locations in order to, to anticipate where the app users will go next. The background signal information would then be used as an alternative to GPS because as the patent describes, it provides the advantage of more accurately or precisely determining a geographic location of a user. The third patent, instead of predicting offline, would predict user movements while they were online, either connected to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or cell tower. The application titled uh, predicting locations and movements of users based on historical locations for users of an online system. Interesting there, huh, folks? You got to really look at that as well. Further details how location data from multiple users of this platform will be used to harvest locations and movement trends to turn into model location connections. According to the patent application, these could be used for a variety of applications, including advertising to users based on locations and providing insights into the movement of, of users. Can we say thought uh, mind control 101, right? Essentially, Facebook will be able 
to have ad pop ads pop up if you're near one of their participating retail or fast food partner using this. Facebook spokesperson Anthony Harrison argues that this is just a concept of BuzzFeed when we often seek patents for the technology we never implemented and patent applications such as this one should not be taken as an indication of future plans. However, given all the recent scandals surrounding Facebook and mishandling the data, just even just as just a concept is a worrying prospect. This has come come as Facebook has removed 800 plus anti-establishment pages while shadow banning numerous others, including silencing alternative news organizations like Free Thought Project, Any Media, and, and others. Individual voices, free speech, and hard work is being censored more and more every day on the platform. It's important to caution readers that the real people are being affected by this to push the silence dissent. To make matters worse for the social media giant, its jur journalist partners, fact checkers have begun speaking out and want to distance themselves from the company the Guardian reported. Interesting indeed, right? In the essence, there's a general consensus that the fact checkers are angry at any alternative outlets for taking their viewers and just censoring their competition. There's no better time to remind readers that there are a number of alternatives out there to proprietary applications like Twitter and Facebook. While we shift into the future, it is even possible for your reader to get paid for your comments and contributions using services like steamit.com, sowme.social, minds.com, and soon gab.ai. Let us move forward into the future of networks to run the tandem with the U.S. government and other governments and not fueled by greed and selling harvest harvested user data, but instead completely decentralized and people power incentive based networks for sharing data you choose to share and rewarding creditors rather than snubbing them for bringing the value to their platforms. And he's absolutely correct. So, in one of those areas, my friends, decentralization is the key. And one thing you don't want to do is centralize and all this good stuff. Okay? That's the main problem. Is, oh, I need, I hate people, oh, I do need Facebook or Twitter. I'm lost. I'm like, give me a break. So that's why I always tell folks about these mainstream social media sites. You got to pay attention. Hey, I love utilizing them. All right? I don't try to get too much personal data in there by any means. So this is one of the areas you got to really look at. And don't get and trap yourselves by putting too much data, personal data on there. So you got to drive them crazy. That's how, they, that's how they make the money. That's how they make money off of you. And all these shadow ban and all that is blowbacking in their faces, my friends. So that's how you got to look at it. And you know what? I gotta say one thing. I'm enjoying every minute of it. So remember, they need us more we need them. Plain and simple. Yeah, I'll do one more here. It's um came out today by Capex. The Jag the Jag Arc of Human Progress by Marion L. Tupi. Interesting here. Human progress, as I attempted to show in a series CapEx articles over the course of this year, is a dramatic and real. The fundamental, fundamentals of real well-being, including life expectancy, income, nutrition, education, personal safety, have improved dramatically, especially over the last two centuries or so. There are those improvements, however, is JAG not linear. Occasional black sliding, black sliding as a finding for the just release. Human Human Freedom Index 2018 is indicated is unavoidable. The index, which is published annually by the Cato Institute, the Fraser Institute, and the Liberals Institute at the Frederick Norman Foundation for Freedom, presents the state of human freedom in the world based on a broad measure that encompasses personal, civil, and economic freedom. As its authors, Ian Vasquez and Ta um, Tanya Porn 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 Porksenek note, Human freedom is a social concept that recognizes the dignity of individuals and is defined here as negative liberty or the absence of co um coser coser oh co coser <laughs> coercive constraint. The index started in 2008. This year's edition contains 2016 data over 162 countries. The index uses 79 distinct indicators of personal, civil, economic freedom. In the following areas, rule of law, security and safety movement, religion, and association, assemb association assembly and civil society, expression and information, identity and relationships, size of the government, legal system, and property rights, access, access to sound money, 
freedom of trade internationally, and regulation of credit, labor, and business. Indicators of personal and civil freedoms are weighed at 50%. The indicators of economic freedom are also weighed in at 50%. In, in, um, individual countries are rated on a scale from 1 to 0 to 10, with higher values representing more freedom. According to the 2018 index, the average human freedom rating for 162 countries in 2016 was 6.89. That's 0 0.01 less than what was the case last year. More specifically, 68 countries increased their rating at 87 decreased their ratings. In 2008, the level of global freedom also has also decreased by 0 0.06. During the intervening decade, 56 countries improved their scores and 81 countries saw their scores deteriorate. The top 10 freest jurisdictions included in descending order. New Zealand, Switzerland, Hong Kong, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, and Denmark tied in sixth place. Ireland and the United Kingdom tied in eighth place. Interesting. And fin Finland, Norway, and Taiwan tied in tenth place. The bottom 10 jurisdictions included in descending order Iran, Burundi, Algeria, Egypt, Sudan, Libya, Iraq, Yemen, Venezuela, and Syria. The highest levels of freedom were North America, Western Europe, and Oceania. The lowest levels were in the Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. The countries that improved on their level of human freedom, most from last year, were Ukraine, Iran, Timor-Leste, Belize, and Niger. The largest deteriorations were in the Seychelles, Sur Suriname, Turkey, Cape Verde, and Poland. Since 2008, the countries have been have seen the greatest improvement in their human freedom scores include Cote d'Ivoire, Angola, Angola, Zimbabwe, Taiwan, and Letizo. Largest deteriorations occurred in Greece, Brazil, Venezuela, Egypt, and Syria. As the author of the index note, freedom is good in on it, in of itself, but freedom is too highly correlated with democracy. Hong Kong being the main exception and with economic well-being, in fact, the countries in the top quartile, i.e. 25% of human freedom enjoy a significantly highly average, higher average per capita income, $32,249, than those in the quarterlies, the average per capita income in at least three quartile, for example, is only $12,026. The author of the index write that freedom plays an important role in human well-being and note the complex ways in which human influences can be influenced by political regimes, economic de development, and the whole range of indicators of the well-being as, web as the editors of website that devote to human progress, I can only concur. Decline in all human freedom shows that progress does not take place along all dimensions of the well human, human well-being of all the time. Thought that, as Harvard University psychologist Steven Pinker notes, will not be progress but a miracle. Finding the findings of the Human Freedom Index 2018 report also reminds us that progress is not guaranteed. To live in a better world, all of us have to be on guard and defend the gains that humanity has made. What's interesting about that because um. Interesting about that because the United States ranked 17 on the Freedom Index. It has went up, so that's a good thing. And we, we should, believe it or not, we should be number one. See, one thing we got to look at, central fund, uh, cent, um, central banking, got to go. Downsides more government, too much federal bureaucracy trying to supersede our Constitution, especially our Bill of Rights culture. Dude, everything has to be done under the supreme law no exceptions that's what's been happening so the United States should be number one in that humanity er effort by 17 it has its ups and downs like everything else we, and we need to renounce the United States of America as a federal corporation just look under um, title 20 is it title 28 yeah title 28 section 3002 subsection 15 so, some of those areas you gotta look at as well. But one thing we can do, we can all do something together as individuals. We can, nullification is just as effective. That can enhance our freedom index a lot more. We gotta treat our brothers, fellow brothers and sisters, 
with love and kindness. Yes, I have my moments too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. Even with some of the folks in the homeless community, but I'm not, I'm not there to condemn. All right. There's some good people in there and you got your shysters. But even some of the shysters, I know how to talk to them. Because sometimes I don't like being, having them jump, being, interrupting me. You know, some of them don't have a tent. Others are learning. We all can learn together. So do this for your moral compass. compass. That's the way it's got to be. Don't fall for the fear of the propaganda matrix of CMT, the mainstream garbage media. That put that, that demoralizes and demoralizes everybody. It's a form of hypnotism. Lesser magic. You can be your own person. And you can liberate yourselves and share that with others. And that is it. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share it through social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or may set something that's interesting, man, to check out. Whatever you do, please feel free to down. Please feel free to share your correspondence with Decorum. I will post all my social media contacts and email addresses on my Spreaker page, okay? Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is helping for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love. And may your guardian spirits be with you.